Good evening all and welcome to this evening's webinar on exam readiness mathematical methods. My name is Brian Lannan, I am your host for the webinar this evening presented to you from Texas Instruments in our 2017 webinar series. This is the second of our exam readiness webinars of this week. Last night we had further mathematics that is now available for uh, download and viewing on the website and tomorrow evening specialist mathematics next week international baccalaureate and in the international baccalaureate will be Bojina Graham uh, who is one of our presenters this evening good evening Bojina good evening everyone and good evening Craig Craig Brown from Geelong hello everybody and Craig I, I just um, you're a, you're a Geelong supporter, are you, mate? No, mate, I'm not. I'm a Hawkman. Okay, I'm a Richmond <laughs> supporter. I, I just thought That's I'd right. point that out. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and greetings and thank you for the, the participants coming in and uh, keying in with uh, a greeting. Now, um, Craig has been uh, teaching teaching mathematics for a while now at uh, at all senior levels, as you can see in his profile here. The thing that impresses me both here, um, using the TI technology, but um, offering PD to fellow teachers, I just think that is so powerful and a great thing to be doing. And of course, he's doing more of that this evening as he shares his expertise with you. I know that you're in store for uh, some clever ideas. We have just been um, conducting a practice session with the panellists and Craig was just showing us some very clever tips. Widgets, uh, do you know how to use widgets? I think that came along in operating system 4.3 or thereabouts. Um, if you don't know how to use them, you're going to find out, so stay tuned. And Bojina will be our other presenter this evening. Bojina, once again, you can see um, an expert in uh, all senior mathematics subjects and also uh, see this bit here um, an examiner so as you prepare your students for their exams I think it's probably worth listening to the person who is examining and going to be marking um, also a, uh, a writer for publishing houses and here's one that particularly impresses me um, uh, masters in engineering good evening Bojina <laughs> Good evening again. <laughs> and uh, I will hand the ball across to Bajina and continue with um, this evening's presentation on exam readiness for mathematical methods. Exams not too far away at all. Good evening everyone. I hope everyone can see my screen now. So yes, we can. What I prepared some multiple choice questions, mainly on algebra functions and calculus, and two extended response questions, and Craig will look at probability questions, so that is our plan. So I will run some live to show how it works, and some prepared just to save some time for those who take much longer. So you can see the question on the left hand side, so the first one is a typical one on the simultaneous linear equations and they have no solutions and there are some options. So if we have calculator screen and we'll go to algebra and we say solve system of linear equations, we have two linear equations for x and y so that will work well and we enter the equations, remembering about times between k and x, minus 4y equals 3, and the second equation is 4x minus k again times y equals 7 minus y, and if I press enter, I have put something wrong there, as it happens, hold on, let me check, kx minus 4x minus k times y. 
Okay, got something different here. That is the answer we should have got. And if I make k equal 4, I will obtain this display, and students should know that, of course, this is one line, so we have two simultaneous, uh, two parallel, uh, one line, the same line, and we have two parallel lines for k equal minus 4. So this is how the calculator can be used for using linear solve. Second question, quite typical as well, is the question on polynomial functions. So also for the students, it's good to think to insert a new problem for every question or some set of questions because we don't want the same variables to repeat. And this time I will use the define function. So we'll define the polynomial t in x equals, and it is 3a cubed. And we need to go down minus 8x squared. So define is a really very nice feature, which can be used for various things, so it's 3a cubed minus a squared, so it is defined. And the question here, if x plus a is a factor, so now we are finding p in negative a, and p comes bold, and now we use menu algebra solve, and we get this, and we solve that for 0 comma a, and we get two answers, so then we can check which one is correct. So define is very useful, and of course, if we define the function, we can later sketch it and so on and use in various situations. Question three is on transformations, and now this question actually can be solved in a few different ways. So going to this question, the transformation is defined using the matrix equation, and we are having the straight line 2x minus y equals 5, and we are going to find out what will be the equation of the straight line after those transformations are applied. So what we can do to start with, we can just use matrices and find out how x and y is transformed by multiplying our matrix by x and y and plusing that, just like it's written. And we know that we get x dashed and y dashed, which I called x1 and y1, and I solve for x and y. And then we substitute this into our original equation, 2x minus y equals 5, as they would do by hand but the calculator handles all algebra, and then we simplify expanding and multiplying to actually arrive at one of the answers. The other way it can be done is using the transformations in the graph screen. So if I go up here, I start with the function y equals 2x minus 5, and now looking at the transformations, I deal with the dilation and reflection first to obtain the next one, the next function, and then I deal with translations. Once it's done, I get the function f6, and now the calculator will tell me what the function f6 is if I open a calculator screen. So the transformations causing lots of problems to students, and as I said, it can be done in two different ways, one using x, y, uh, x dashed, y dashed, one using the graphing, and students learn basically also graphical way or algebraic way. So the next question, too fun is the question on functional equations for 
this one, XJNA prepared the notes page. So the notes page has this advantage that if I have that prepared, so it's done, and it is easy to change the function. So of course I use the one which is true, but if I look at my equation and I go X, and clearly it is not telling me that it is true. So that can be prepared as widget, and Craig will talk more about widget, or it can be just saved <coughs> for various functional equations, could have some combinations and play with functions. So of course, if we use square root x, likewise, it's not going to work. And students should recognize that if it displays something different than true, it is not the functional equation. So that is using the notes pages here. The next question is quite a straightforward question, saying if k is this definite integral, then e to k is equal to. So we can easily get a calculator screen and use a definite integral, which I'm getting from the template. And the integral is 1, 2, 3. And our function is 1 over x dx. So that's what I'm getting, and then if I apply e to x to this power, I'm getting the answer. So that's, of course, an easy question, but again, showing the power of the calculator. Going to question number four, again, as you can see, I have different problems, so each problem here on the top shows problem three, four, the variables and definitions are not remembered from one to another, so that's a good thing for students, so sometimes they have something and it comes bold and marks up all the calculations. So this is using the tangent, tangent feature on the calculator, so again, if I open a new screen and we go to menu calculus and we use tangent. So for tangent we just enter the right hand side of the equation which is 2 ln, I might just move it down so it shows what my equation is, 2 ln and we have 3 minus 2 x and we need to say comma x, and we need to say at which point. So we want the tangent to this function, and variable is x at point x equal 1. So the question is actually asking <laughs> at the point intercept the y-axis, so clearly we can <coughs> solve that, substitute x equals 0, and get the answer equals 4. So the tangent and similarly there is also the tangent and normal line and the calculator will easily deal with those. Let's go to question 7, which is the average rate of change. And I have two questions here. One is average rate of change and one is the average value of the function, just to illustrate, of course, that there are two different concepts, and again, if I, let's say, insert new problem, and this time I want the calculator, and I will use define again, so my function is f in x equals x squared times e to the power 2x, so the function is defined, and now the average rate of change between 0 and 2. So we enter the fraction, and we go f in 2 minus f in 0 divided by 2 minus 0, and we get the exact value of the 
uh, average rate of change between those two points. That could also be pre-done using the notes page. Like if we go to the next question, and I would like to do it in the notes page, then we need to enter a notes page. In notes page, we need to press Control M if we want to <coughs> use maps. This is the maps box, so we go define, and this time I'm saying f in x equals, oh, it comes bold because I didn't change that. That <coughs> might, that will not actually matter if I define the same function again, times e to the power 2x. So it is done, and now we look at the values of the interval. So we might go 0, assign to A. Oops, the other way around. I always have the wrong, so I'll try again. A, assign, A, assign 0. That's better. And then we go B assign our value is 2. So that can be pre-done, setting it up this way. And then again, we enter the formula. Now, this formula is not actually in the formula booklet, but it doesn't matter because if that's exam 2, the students would have their bound books. And here we go from A to B, and the function is defined here as in x and oops f in x something doesn't seem to be no and we get the answer. Now as you see we get <laughs> the exact answer. If I want the same as the approximate answer in notes pages, uh, control enter doesn't quite work, so we do the same thing with the approximate in front. So if I copy that and paste it here, then it will give me the approximate answer because for this one it was required to have the approximate answer. So moving on, using another feature which is quite nice, it is, I know, this question will be first just on composite functions. So again, if I go and insert new problem and I add the calculator, so for the composite functions, again, we go menu, actions define, and I defined each of the functions. So f in x equals, of course it's important when we deal with trig functions that we are in radians, but method students always should be in radians. So we go sine x on 2, and we define menu actions defined, we define our g in x, g in x equals 2x plus 5, and then we can do any composition on the calculator. This time it's asking for g in f in x, so this is our function. So of course students should be able to see the range from here, but sometimes they don't. So if they still have difficulty, we can sketch it. So we can sketch this function here. And then if I go a bit higher to see <coughs> the top and the bottom, we can find the minimum and we can find the maximum. And clearly the range is 3 to 7. So that is using, again, define for the composition and graphing if we want to look at the range. Question number 10 is C. 
similar, but this time we'll be solving using the, for the average value function. I might go to this question here, so that's the next one. So we know the average value of the function x ln x between 0 and a equals to minus a quarter, and we want to find the value of a. So the way to do it, we use the definite integral from 0 to a, x ln x dx, and that comes up as this answer. We divide by a because we have the average value of the function, and then we know that this average value is minus a quarter, so we solve for a, and we get two answers, and we match which one is given in the question. This question, I modeled question 11 on the last year question where the, line, the length of the line segment joining the two points and so on. So that is the similar question to the other one. So again, if we define the function and find the values as shown, we can easily find the length using the distance formula. Using the graph trace is also quite a nice feature. So if I start on a new problem, and this time I will put the graph, and our function is 2 square root 1 minus x, and plus 3. So those functions on the domain and range now become are getting a bit, I need to go to window hint, just to go a bit higher to see the graph. So of course, I could find the domain of this function using the <laughs> domain, but they're not asking for the domain. So it was f1 in x and the uh, comma x, uh, okay, domain needs comma x, too fast. Uh, what is going on here? Okay, so the calculator gives the domain, so there won't be many questions on finding the domain. The questions are becoming a big different, like this question, <coughs> we know the range and we want to go back to the domain. So if we go to menu trace and graph trace, so it comes up originally always with the y-intercept, but I can go minus 1 and it gives me the value, which is not what we want. We need to go to 7 minus 2, gives me 6.46, and if I go minus 3, I get 7, so clearly the domain, <coughs> the domain is minus 3 to 0. So this is the feature graph trace, and it can be used in other contexts as well. Now, <coughs> using a numerical integration file, I use that, of course, it doesn't have to be necessarily used. But there is a file which actually allows you to change the function, and we have left, right, and other things we <coughs> asking here for the right, and we have four intervals, and what this file gives, gives approximate and exact area. I won't play with that today because <coughs> there isn't quite enough time. But, of course, this question can also be done by just taking a quarter of f in 0 plus f in minus 2, 5, and taking away the exact value of the function. So that's the other way of doing that. But in my files, you will find the numerical integration file, which sometimes may come quite handy. I'm just watching the time, so I might look at the extended response question, because <coughs> I only have five minutes, and this extended response question has the new feature, which is the relations feature on the calculator. So I will get a new 
file and we'll start with graphs and we have the function e to the power minus 0.5x and we might restrict the domain here as it says the domain is x is between 0 x and 3 so this is our graph and I might move that and zoom it in a bit here now one of the parts of the question is asking for the inverse function and the point of intersection so in graph if we go to graph entry number two is relation so if I want to draw the inverse graph I need to say x equals f1 in y and the inverse graph is drawn so now I can find the point of intersection between this one is needing the little square and we get the point of intersection so that's how we can get the point of intersection between the graph of the function and the inverse function looking further at some questions it's asking for the equation of the tangent line so if I get the graph screen again and enter my graph and make it again a bit bigger so we can draw the tangent by using the geometry feature points and lines and tangent to the graph and we want the tangent at x equals 1 so the tangent is drawn now however we can't quite use the bounded area using the tangent so we can draw it but because I'm running out of time I just show you what we can do we can find the tangent line and <coughs> save it as a function let's say tangent in x and then draw a tangent line and then we can use the bounded area to find the area between the graph and the tangent and I have two minutes so I quickly look at the last question which is trig question so we are given the height of pi, low is 1 meter, high 9 meters, and we know the period, and we want to model it with this cos graph. So to do that, students can, of course, calculate the amplitude and the middle line and sketch the graph. So they find A, B, and N, and then they draw the graph, as I did here, so they can check that the graph works, having the period 25 and the <coughs> low tight 1 and high tight 9. Now, the part B is asking, what is the earliest time at which the tight is increasing at the fastest rate? So if we draw the gradient graph on the same set of axes, so of course this is the point where we have the fastest rate and this rate is given there as well now it says to two decimal places in case it asks for other accuracy we can change the settings in the graph screen just show that and now we see more decimal places so this feature is available in the graph screen as well and looking at the next part what is the average height of the tide so again we have the function defined between those two values so using the average value of the function and the last part of the question is saying that assume that in winter the tide follows a different pattern so the period is the same but high tide and low tide change and the low tide occurs at midnight so here we, <coughs> I have sketched the other graph taking those things into consideration and the question is describing where 
the transformations which need to be applied. So if students see it graphically, they can see it's a reflection in the x-axis and dilation factor com comparing the amplitudes. And try the matrix equation. The calculator won't have that much here. They would need to use their skills. So that's what I had time to do. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, we'll pass to Craig. Yeah, well, um, Bojuna, that's fantastic. And I, I, you're talking about the time there, but uh, I can tell you the crowd is calling for more <laughs> when, you, when you read the <laughs> chat there. Um, and very, very pertinent, uh, relevant stuff. The, the questions that you've developed there, um, very typical exam questions, uh, shall I say, very predictable type exam questions, which of course is the game that we're, we're all trying to do at the moment, is, is second guess what's going to be on, on this year's paper. Mm, but you've also yep. armed us with some <laughs> wonderful strategies there. I really like the side by side. There's the question and there's the strategy. This is how to deal with it. Um, can I just ask you, Bajina, uh, um, will you be plan in the, the files that we share, will you be sharing the, um, your, your file of questions there? Yes, it's everything there. Questions and Fantastic. files, everything yep. is there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I tell you what, I'm, I'm not teaching um, methods this year, but if I, if I was, I would be giving my students, because they have practice papers for breakfast, lunch and dinner at this time of year, I would be giving them your practice paper. That's what my class is say, doing, yes, believe me. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I'd say sit down and okay, watch this webinar. Okay, thank webinar. you. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. And and there's more to come. There's more yet. So um, Craig Brown, as you can see, his screen at the moment uh, has uh, a set of questions on the left and he has the strategies ready to go on the right. Tell us all about it, Craig. Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, cover an extended response question, um, which is uh, covering um, a good deal of the probability that was um, certainly examined on um, last year's um, exam, so similar sort of thing to last year's exam. Um, but I'm also going to do it with a little bit of a twist where um, I'll show you uh, some applications of some widgets. And so before I start that, we probably need to um, explain what a widget is. A widget is simply a TNS file, but is actually stored in a folder on the uh, software as well as the calculators called My Widgets. And so if we actually uh, go exploring um, onto our um, calculator and if you can see it with mine here uh, in my folder up here my widgets I've actually got all these TNS files stored into my, my widget um, folder which means as I uh, want to in fact insert a widget which is in fact what we have an object option down here when we want to insert an, a page in a file, if I click on that, then I have all those files ready um, pre-written, um, ready to go to, in fact, um, do some of the mathematics that we're, that's expected of us. And so what I think I'll okay, do is just show you, give you a quick example on how to create a basic widget, and then I'll, I'll get to it. Craig, what just I've done is up, opened up a um, page here. Sorry, Brian. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm running a poll in the, in the background um, asking people uh, if they're already familiar with widgets or not. Uh, it's a multiple choice poll open at the moment. Uh, yes, you've used the widgets. No, you haven't. I put in option C um, because it described me uh, when, the, when the widgets came out in, and I've forgotten which operating system now. I, I, I opened it up and I got the stopwatch widget and I thought, well, that's cute. Um, is that all? And I hadn't visited it again until uh, earlier this year, when someone about your size explained to me uh, this is this is what you can really do with them. Uh, very powerful. Uh, okay, so I'll, uh, I'll look get for the poll. Yeah. Um, so what I'll do is do I create a simple widget, widget uh, for say Pythagoras' theorem, and so okay, I'll press um, Control M to open type a math box in uh, the notes application. 
And so I'll go side, one of the short sides, I'll call side A, let's call that um, 3. And so we'll go another short side, call that B, we'll call that 4. And let's say C, we don't know. So what I'll do is I'll put a little question mark there, like so. And then, OK, I'm going to go solve C squared equals A squared plus B squared. I'm going to solve for the question mark. And, OK, there we have it. Now, so what I'm going to now do is say this. As I said, it's, as you can see, it's a, it's a um, simply a TMS file, but just remember we can only actually create, a widget is just one page of a file. So you can, it's just a one page application. And so what I'll do is I'll go and save this now. And so I'm going to go through and find my, if I go up to the folder called My Widgets, which is here. So when I save into My Widgets, I'll call this PT for Pythagoras Theorem will do me. You obviously could call it something sensible. I'll save it. So there we are. We have actually created a, a nice little widget. And so I'll now go ahead and open a new file. Let's, in fact, I'll close that. Let's pretend it's done with. I'll open up a new file and let's pretend that I'm doing some maths and I all of a sudden require the use of Pythagoras Theorem. And I know full well then I've got a nice little widget that will do Pythagoras Theorem. So as you can see, I've uh, tried to insert a, a page and I've chosen Widget and I'm going to go down and find PT, Pythagoras Theorem. I'm going to add it. And as you can see now, what I created before comes up. Notice that the, the boxes are not at, um, activated, the math boxes, so it's a matter of making some changes that will actually suit the question that I'm doing at hand. So I might change that to 7. I might actually have to make that the question mark. I'm trying to find a short side. And that can be 23. And so if I press Enter and press Enter there, don't forget that you need to actually activate the maps boxes. So highlight them and, and press Enter. Now I'll go down to where all the business is done. And as we can see, we have now got um, the solution to that particular little problem. As you can see there, that's the exact form. But if you highlight and press Control Enter, you get the decimal equivalent as well. Or if I want to go backwards again, just press Enter, and I'm back to exact form. And so that's basically how we uh, create simple widgets. What I'll now do is actually get busy with the um, uh, problem at hand here, with doing a little bit of probability. But what I will do is show you in some of the um, widgets that I've created to actually uh, get some of the questions done. So on the left hand side of my screen here, we've got a factory making batches of white chocolate from a machine. The time taken uh, to make each batch of chocolate, T, can be described by the probability density function, all this over here. So straight away we can see it's um, a continuous random variable type question. So what I'm going to do is open up a problem. So I'm going to do, uh, in fact, yeah, insert a new problem. And I'm going to create, a, I've created a widget called CRV. You'll notice that all the widgets are in alphabetical order. And so I'll add that. And it, a quick, by, a quick inspection, um, you can see up the top of the page there, I've in fact, uh, that's where I'm defining the function. And further down, I've got a number of different things that would require us to um, possibly do some of the calculations. And so, I'll move that out of the road. And so, I will now go up and define the function. So. First of all here, this is where we're going to define our function. Um, and so we can see by here, uh, it's 0 for t being less than um, 0. And
and basically above zero, we've got the function defined. So the way I've actually set this up, um, this will suffice. So I'm going to go f of x equals a times by e to the power of negative 0.1x. You'll notice I've actually got it in terms of x, so that's something that we have to be aware of because it's actually a, a generic file. Press enter. Right, now the lower bound, so basically we're starting off at zero. So L I've defined as lower bound and the upper bound will be infinity. So we go find infinity, which is over here, and press enter. So now I've actually defined the function. Just be mindful that if you're doing a different question where in fact you require there's more um, functions defined in the hybrid section, um, you can use your template and use um, these templates over here to um, help you answer other questions. However, um, what we'll do is I'll undo it that and go back to that, press enter. So now I'm ready to go to answer the question. The first thing over here it says find the value of A. So to find the value of A we know in fact that um, the area under the curve has to equal 1. So what I'm going to do is as you can see here I've in fact got a section where that in fact we can um, use the solving function on the calculator. So we know that the area equals 1, so I'll change that to 1. And we know that the integral has to be between the lower bound and the upper bound. So I'll change that to u. Now, if we go back to up here, we can see that I'm solving for a. So it would be a good idea if I change, not change the c here to an a. And if I press enter, there's our value for a. Now that we've done that, I'm going to go up here and put 0.1 in for a. Notice now when I actually scroll down, that makes that statement true, which we'd expect. And I'm ready to now go on and uh, answer some more questions. The next question says find the probability uh, between 0 and 11. And so very quickly, that's just working out standard calculation for probability. So as you can see here, normal calculations probability. I've got some choices. I could actually uh, change these up here to 0 and 11. So lower bound 0, change this to 11. And if I do that and press enter, I get the calculation. Or if you actually want to keep the, the upper bound um, the way for the whole um, domain of the function, so I'll change that to um, infinity again, like so. Instead, we can just change the terms, the um, integrands here, so that make that uh, zero, and that will be eleven. And as you can see, I get the same answer. So moving right on to the next question, now we're looking at the probability of t being bigger than eight. That would suggest then the, the number down the bottom here has to be eight, and this here would have to be infinity. So we change that to infinity and press enter and we get the answer accordingly. Moving right along, the company knows it takes more than three minutes to make uh, the chocolate. Um, find the probability that it takes less than five minutes. So this is uh, an example where in fact we've got some conditional probability happening. So in doing this, what we end up having to do is, first of all, it says here the company knows it takes more than three minutes, so it's going to be from three to infinity. If I press that, I get the 0.7408. And the next thing we also have to do is, it says find the probability that it takes less than five minutes. So less than five minutes, but more than eight. So that will be between three and five, I should say, I think, which is um, 0 0.134. And so now it's a matter of getting those two separate calculations because an example of conditional probability, 
and divide them accordingly. So I'll just open up a math box here, Control M, and I probably should have done this beforehand, quite frankly. So I'll copy that, Control C, Control V, divided by, and I better change it back the way I had. So that was from um, three to infinity. Copy that, Control C, and Control V, and there we have it, we've uh, got the answer. Moving right along, it says find the mean time it takes to make the chocolate. Well, I've actually got that as a predefined um, calculation in here, so as you can see, it's x times y f of x. The one thing you want to check is to make sure, in fact, you've got the lower limits and upper limits set the way it should be in terms of um, the domain of what's the function. And so if that's the case, it's about just clicking that and pressing enter, and we get the value of 10, which is the correct answer. So we'll move, move along. Another machine in the factory can make milk chocolate. The time it takes to make the chocolate uh, M is normally distributed with a mean of 10 and the standard deviation of 2. So now it's finding, it's a typical uh, question, find the probability that M is between 0 and 11. So yes, we have got the inbuilt functions on the calculator, but uh, like I said, I've actually um, been playing around creating widgets, so no, and I've actually done a widget for this as well. So I'm going to insert a new problem now, and insert widget. And I've got this one as normal distribution probability calcs. If I add that, and here you can see all the, the pre-written information coming up. So it's a matter of now typing this in accordingly. So we're told in the question the mean is 10, with a standard deviation of 2, 2 minutes. OK, and so the lower bound and the upper bound, so the lower bound is 0, so we'll type in 0 there, and the upper bound is 11. And there it is, and that I've done that, we click on the box there for the normal CDF calculation, and we get the answer 0.69. Next question says that um, the company uh, wants to be able to make 90% of its milk chocolate within 12 minutes. Um, is the machine able to achieve this? Right, so now this is actually an, um, an inverse uh, normal calculation. So it says the company wants to be able to make, make the chocolate, 90% uh, of chocolate within 12 minutes. That would suggest that the area to the left of the value that we're after is 0.9. But it was, if it's some other value, you would naturally click on there and make the change, but that's okay for us. And now that we've done that, it's just simply a matter now of uh, clicking on the calculator there, the, the, the box, I should say, and we can see that the answer is 12.56. And considering that they're wondering if they're able to do this, the answer would clearly be no. Okay. <clears throat> Moving right along to the next question. One afternoon the machine breaks down and has to be fixed um, and the, comp the company that makes the chocolate is, is, are concerned that the mean time for the production has increased. If 90% of the chocolate is produced in T time, less than 40, uh, 45 minutes, calculate the mean time mean based on this information, assuming that the standard deviation is the, time, is the um, same. Right, so in being able to do this, as we can say, this is an example where in fact we've got to um, calculate the new mean. Now the first thing we uh, can see that in fact 90% of the chocolates are produced in 14.5 uh, minutes, so in less than 14.5 minutes, so what we need to do is if that's the case, First of all, uh, work out the corresponding um, number on the z-curve for the 90%. Um, so that's, that's an inverse normal. So we're going to mean of 
zero and standard deviation of one for the standard normal curve. Now the lower limit in this case would be you could put negative infinity or just basically make it negative a really small number, negative ten or something like that. Uh, now, oh, actually, you need to actually do that. All, and all we need to do is the mean and the standard deviation because this is an inverse normal question. The area up here is, uh, again, 0 0.9. And so you can see automatically the information has been updated. So we get a Z uh, score of 1.28. So now it's a matter of um, solving the equation solve, and we can grab this number or just type in 1.28155 will do us, equals, then we'll go 14.5, 14 minus the new mean that we're trying. Yes, I can spell mean, but as you can see, when I kept, kept the one in, it actually recognising the pre, the um, inbuilt function called mean, so I've just called it the double N instead to fix that. And the standard deviation is still two, and we're going to just basically solve that for the value of the mean, and we get an answer of 11.9636. All right, and so moving right along, so back over to our question. Chocolates are packed in boxes of uh, 20. Six of these are known to be underweight. The quality of the uh, controller chooses four chocolates from the box. Let P hat be the proportion of underweight chocolates in the sample. So what are the values of P hat? Now, we can actually hope we'll probably see the um, talk to our students what that might be, but um, I've also got actually a written a um, widget that will actually cater for this as well. So if we insert a new problem and go down for another wi another widget, and this time I'm looking for, there we go, sample proportions from a small population, which is what this is. So I'll add the widget. Now, you can see I've actually been able to manage to combine two pages. You can sort of do it with a, bit of, with a little bit of cheating. Um, but what I need to do is actually split that up. So if I press Control 6, it actually now breaks up the two separate pages. It's grouping and ungrouping, which is a, a feature on the calculator. I'm now going to go up to the top of the page. Right, the, the, um, the total for this particular question, it says packed in boxes of 20. So we go the total is 20, and we've got a sample of four being chosen, four chocolates being chosen, so I'll just click on that and press enter. Now this stands for the favourable attributes. We're talking about um, underweight chocolates, and we know six of them are known to be underweight, so six of them is the total. Now this here, favourable attributes in the sample, we're talking about underweight chocolates, so what I can do is choose zero for no, the possibility of no um, underweight chocolates being chosen from in our sample of four. When I click on this and press enter, that works out the proportion of those chocolates in the sample. And then if I click on this calculation here and press enter, you can see, in fact, it gives, it gives me the corresponding probability, which means that if I change this to one and press enter, um, we now can get the, the information automatically updated. But back to the question, it says, what are the possible values of uh, p hat? Well, what we can do is display all the results at once by clicking on that box there. There are all the values of p hat. And if I click on this particular box here, and you can see the formula there, and I'm pressing Enter, I get the, calcul the calculations um, also calculated. And what I've done is I've actually got that information coming into that particular page there, better way of um, displaying the probability distribution. You're probably wondering the fact that the formulas are disappearing, and so I'll use this as an example uh, here. Um, if I click on it, 
what I'm actually doing is changing the attributes of the maths box. So if I actually press menu, calculations, and, oops, start again, escape, escape, uh, maths box attributes, number five is what I'm after, maths box attributes, you can see the input output, I'm actually hiding the input, which is what gets typed in to produce the results. So if I actually change that to show input and output, I end up with the, um, the formula that's actually staying there. All right, so moving right along, so I've displayed the probability distribution P, that is over there. Next part of the question, over the long term, it is known that 25% of the chocolates are produced that are produced by the factory are underway. Let P be the proportion of underweight chocolates in a box of 20. So now this is turning into a sampling from a larger population. So what I've got, I'll insert another widget. So another problem. And insert another widget. And this time what I've got is some one here, calculations so from large populations plus the standard deviation rules. So I'll add that. And so, so from this question, we're talking about boxes, so sample size of 20. So I'll change that to 20. And the population proportion is 25%, so 0.25. Now, the question actually says over here, find the probability that P hat is bigger than 0.5. So I put in 0.5 in here, and, uh, oops, try that again, 0.5 like so. Now the number in the sample, and as you can see, there's the little formula that works out the number in the sample. And so n times by p hat, that gives me 10. You'd like to think that the students would be able to work that out, but, you know, let's not assume it too much. Now that we've actually done that, we can now turn this over and uh, calculate, use the binomial PDF or CDF uh, function that calculator to, in fact, answer the question. And so, as you can see here, well, from the question, we're talking about PAT being bigger than 0 0.5. That's the same as, basically, um, in the binomial PDF, being um, bigger than 10. So we need to use the binomial CDF function our calculator, which... I haven't got in there, so what I will do is go control M and go binomial CDF, so menu, calculations, um, probability, distributions, and binomial, whoops, binomial CDF. So the number of trials, which is the sample, whoops, I'll move this somewhere. I should probably press OK. Oops, oops. N, I can't actually see what N was now. N is, oh, 20. So 20, probability of success is 0 0.25. The lower bound is going to be from 11, because it has to be bigger than 10, and the upper bound would be um, 20. I press OK, um, and we get the calculation done accordingly. Um, the next question, probability of between those values, P hat being um, 0 0.2 to 0 0.6, so between those values, I should say. So if I go back over to here, um, 0 0.2, Right, uh, oops, wrong one, wrong one, P hat, I should be changing, so change it to 0.5, change this P hat to 0 0.2. Okay, so we're talking between 4, and then change this to 0.6. So between 4 and 12, but notice we're not allowed to equal them. So back to the binomial CDF, that would be between 5 and 11. Oops, what have I done there? Done something silly. Oh, 11. And there we have it. The calculation has been completed for us. We're running out of time, so I'll quite quickly uh, finish this question off. 
The next part is a sample of 250 chocolates are taken. 45 of these are found to be underweight. State the point estimate for the proportion of underweight chocolates and then it goes ahead and says find a 95% confidence interval for this information. Well, this might surprise you, but I've got a widget for that too. So I'll insert another problem. And it doesn't surprise me at all, Craig. Oh, it doesn't does. surprise me at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll go down and find confidence intervals. And so, as you can see again, uh, without activating anything, you see the formulas I've used in terms of uh, working out. They're the standard formulas you see in the textbooks. Yes, we've also got the inbuilt function to be able to do um, the, the, uh, the confidence intervals as well. But uh, let's finish this question off. So we've got a sample size of 250. So 250 can go there. The point estimate is 45 out of 250. So 45 out of 250. 95% confidence interval. That's already 95. I'll just choose that. The um, value that we get from the standard normal curve is 1.96. That's a familiar number. The margin of error is that. And then the confidence intervals, if you just click on each of these boxes, as you can see, they are calculated. The beauty about this, though, now, of course, is if I change this to a 99% confidence interval, uh, it automatically gets updated. And there you have it. Or if we wanted to change the value of n, it's very quickly updated for us. All right, uh, Brian, that just about brings us to the end of the uh, presentation. I've just had enough time to finish that off. Um, what I'll, what I'll, I'll naturally enough uh, make available these files, but I've also got a, I've had a plug play around with the inverse binomial as well, and so I'll make that available uh, as well so people can have a play with that, that part of the calculator. Terrific, uh, and thank you very much. And screen roulette there. I want to show across to this. Thanks, thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, look, as far as probabilities goes, I can tell you what, I wouldn't mind placing a bet that uh, within a week's time, we're going to have a whole lot of classes of maths method students that are going to have uh, the Craig Brown maths methods widget pack installed on their machines that they take into the exams. Very, very valuable. Um, looking at the participant numbers there, nobody, absolutely nobody went home early. Um, and uh, I think we've just got a, a wealth of uh, wonderful supporting material there from both our presenters, both uh, Craig and Bojina. Thank you to you both. Uh, at the time of year when time, of course, is so precious, I think we've got a, a large team of attendees this evening who have made a very good investment of an hour of their time. And as I said before, if I were if I were teaching methods myself this year, my students would be doing those papers and then viewing this webinar um, as a follow-up. So thank you to you both. And a reminder no, to... Terrific. And, and a reminder to attendees, um, the Specialist Maths uh, webinar, if you're, if you're interested, the exam readiness, I said it was tomorrow. No, it's next Tuesday. Next Tuesday evening is the Specialist Maths exam readiness webinar. And also, if you or your colleagues are teaching further mathematics, the exam readiness webinar for that went to air last night. Uh, that will be published shortly on the Texas Instruments Australia website and also through the YouTube channel. As we close out, and thank you for the accolades that I see you texting in, that's uh, putting in through the chat, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, um, and, and we will write to you too with those supporting files, both TNS and the um, exam papers. I've been discussing it with the, the panellists, and we've all agreed that you qualify for the graduation certificate from this cool. evening's webinar. Well done. A round of applause. And uh, in response to that, I would appreciate, or we would appreciate, if you could take a moment when we exit to fill in the, uh, the feedback form. And here is a, a very useful link for you, because if you click on that, you go to the uh, Texas Instruments Australia YouTube channel, where you, uh, in a couple of days' time, will be able to view a recording of this evening's webinar. 
as well as all the others that we have there, including a set of short snippets that have been made directly for students, and that is published now, Exam Readiness for Mathematical Me Methods. You will find about uh, 20 or more short five to ten minute snippets for your students. That, uh, that's a new project that we've just done this year. So um, all the best, good evening to all, and I will close us out. All the best.